At the entrance to the camp in the yellow cliffs was a pile of human heads. Three birds would have liked to stop and look through the heads for a while to see if any friends of his were represented in the pile. Ahumado had killed many Comanches, some of them his friends. Probably a few of their heads were in the pile. Many of the heads still had the hair on them, from what he could see. Three Birds was curious. He had never seen a pile of heads before, and would have liked to know how many heads were in the pile. But it didn't seem a polite thing to ask. Those are just some heads he's cut off people, Tudwall said in a friendly voice. Three Birds didn't comment. His view was that Tudwall wasn't really as friendly as he sounded. He might be the man who skinned people. Three Birds didn't want to banter idly about cut-off heads with a man who might skin him. He won't take your head, though, Tudwall said. For you it will be the pit, or else the cliff. Three Birds soon observed that the camp they were coming to was poor. Two men had just killed a brown dog and were skinning it so that it could be put in the cookpot. A few women who looked very tired were grinding corn. An old man with several knives strung around his belt came out of a cave and looked at him. Is he the one who skins people? Three Birds asked. We all skin people, Tudwal said. But Goyeto is old like Ahumado. Goyeto has had the most practice. Three Birds thought it all seemed very odd. Ahumado was supposed to have stolen much treasure in his robberies, but he didn't seem rich. He just seemed like an old, dark man who was cruel to people. It was all puzzling. Three Birds broke into his death song while puzzling about it. He wondered if Kicking Wolf would die from being pulled behind the horse they had tied him to. Three Birds was soon taken off the horse and allowed to sit by one of the campfires, but nobody offered him food. Around him were the yellow cliffs pocked with caves. Eagles soared high above the cliffs, eagles and buzzards as well. Three Birds was startled to see so many great birds high above the cliffs. On the plains where he lived, he seldom saw many eagles. He had expected to be tortured as soon as he was brought into the camp, but no one seemed in any hurry to torture him. Tudwall went into a cave with a young woman and was gone for a long time. The great force of pistoleros that Ahumado was said to command were nowhere in evidence. There were only five or six men there. Ahumado walked over and sat on a blanket. Three birds stopped singing his death song. It seemed foolish to sing it when no one was paying any attention to him at all. Two old women were making tortillas, which gave off a good smell. In the Comanche camp, prisoners were always fed, even if they were to be promptly killed or tortured. But that did not seem to be the custom in the camp of Ahumado. No one brought him tortillas or anything else. When the day was almost past, Tudwall came and sat with him. A peculiar thing about the man, who was white but very dirty, was that his left eye blinked all the time, a trait that three birds found disconcerting. I have been with six women today, Tudwall said. The women are Ahumados, but he lets me have them. He is too old for women himself. His only pleasure is killing. Three birds kept quiet. It was in his mind that they might start his torture at any time. If that happened, he would need all his courage. He did not want to weaken his courage by chatting with a braggart like Tudwall. He wondered how Kicking Wolf was faring. If the horse was still dragging him, he was probably thoroughly skinned up. Finally, Ahumado stood up and motioned for Tudwall to bring the prisoner. Tudwall cut the thongs that bound Three Bird's ankles and helped him to his feet. Ahumado led them to the base of one of the high cliffs where there was a big pit. Tudwall led Three Birds to the edge of the pit and pointed down. In the bottom, Three Birds could see several rattlesnakes and also a rat or two. You can't see the scorpions and spiders, but there are many down there, Tudwall said. Every day the women go out and turn over rocks to find more scorpions and spiders for the pit. Without a word, Ahumado turned toward the cliff and began to climb up a narrow trail of steps cut into the rock. The trail led higher and higher toward the top of the cliff. Ahumado climbed the trail quite easily, but Three Birds, because his hands were bound, had some trouble. He could not use the handholds Ahumado used and Tudwall. Because of his difficulty with the steps, Tudwall began to insult him. You are not much of a climber, he said. 
Ahumado is old, but he is already almost to the top of the cliff. That was true. Ahumado had already disappeared above them. Three birds tried to ignore Tudwall. He concentrated on making his feet go up the trail. He had never been so high before. In his country, the beautiful country of the plains, even birds did not fly as high as he was being asked to climb. It seemed to him he was as high as the clouds, only it was a clear evening with no clouds. Behind him, Tudwall grew impatient with Three Birds' slow climbing. He began to poke him with a knife. Three Birds tried to ignore the knife, though soon both his legs were bloody. Finally, he reached the top of the cliff. The black vaquero was standing there, waiting. The climb had taken so long that the sky was red with sunset. When Three Birds reached the top, he found that his lungs were hurting. There didn't seem to be much air atop the old man's yellow cliffs. Around him there was distance, though, a great distance, with the peaks of the Sierra Perdida reddened by sunset stretching as far away as he could see. Three birds were so high he wasn't quite sure he was still on the earth. It seemed to him he had climbed into the country of the birds, the birds for which he was named. He was in the country of the eagles. It was no wonder he could hardly find air to breathe. Near the edge of the cliff, not far away, there were four posts stuck in the ground, with ropes going from the posts over the edge of the cliff. Nearby, four men, as dark as Ahumado, were squatting by a little fire. Ahumado made a motion, and the dark men went to the first post and began to pull on the rope. Suddenly, as the dark men pulled, three birds heard a loud beating of wings, and several great vultures swirled up over the edge of the cliff, almost into their faces. One of the vultures, with a red strip of meat in its mouth, flapped so close to three birds that he could have touched it. Three birds was wondering why the strange old man and his skinny pistolero had brought him so high on the cliff, but he did not have to wonder long, for the dark man pulled a cage made of mesquite branches tightly lashed together onto the top of the cliff. It was not a large cage. The dead man in it had not much room while he was alive, but the vultures could easily get their heads through and eat the dead man little by little. The man's bones were still together, but a lot of him was eaten. There was not much left of the man, who had been small like the dark men who raised the cage. As soon as the cage was on solid ground, the dark men opened it and quickly pitched what was left of the stinking corpse over the cliff. Now three birds knew why they had brought him to the top of the cliff. They were going to put him in a cage and hang him off the cliff. He walked to the edge of the cliff and looked down. There were three more cages dangling below him. There is a vaquero down there who is still alive, Tudwall said. We only put him in two weeks ago. A strong man, if he is quick, can stay alive a month in the cages. Why does he need to be quick if he is in a cage? Three birds asked. Quick or he don't eat, Tudwall said. Pigeons light on the cages. If the man inside is quick, he can catch birds to eat. We had a card shop once who lasted nearly two months. He was quick with his hands. Old Ahumado walked over then. He did not smile. The cage or the pit? He asked. The snakes or the birds? If I were you, I would take the pit, Tudwall said. It's warmer down there. There's some big rats you could eat if they don't eat you first. Or you could eat a snake. Three birds was watching the dusk fill up the canyons to the south. He felt he was in the sky, where the spirits lived. Perhaps the spirits of his wife and children were not far away. Or the spirits of his parents and grandparents, all dead from the shitting sickness. They were all in the high air somewhere where he was. It might even be that Kicking Wolf was dead, in which case his spirit would be near. Choose, Ahumado said. It is almost dark. It is a long way back down to the pit if you want the pit. Don't you have a better cage to put me in? Three birds asked. This is a filthy cage. It has parts of that dead man sticking to it. I don't think I will be comfortable in such a filthy cage. Tudwall was astonished. He gave a nervous laugh. It is the only cage we have, he said. Maybe it'll rain and wash away some of that blood. It isn't the only cage you have, Three Birds pointed out in a calm, reasonable voice. 
There are three more cages down there. You showed them to me. They are full, Tudwal said. There's that vaquero who's still alive and two dead men. You could throw the dead men out, three birds pointed out. Maybe one of those cages would be cleaner. There was silence on the cliff. Tudwal was disconcerted. What did this Comanche think he was doing? It was crazy to bargain with Ahumado. It would only cause him to think up something worse to do to the prisoner. He doesn't like our cage, Ahumado said. Take him back down. We'll let Goyeto skin him. Before Tudwal could reach him, three birds took two quick steps to the very edge of the cliff. In only a second, he could put himself beyond the reach of the old torturer and his blinking henchmen. He only had to step backwards, and he would be gone forever, into the fine air where the spirits lived. For a while, he would fly like the birds he was named after. Then he would be where the spirits were, without having wasted any time in the dirty pit or the filthy cage. Three birds had always been a clean man. He was glad they had brought him to a high place, where the air was clean. In a moment, he would go backward, into his final home in the air. But he wanted to speak to Ahumado and his henchmen before he left them. You are stupid men, he said. A child could fool you. Now Big Horse Skull is coming, and he is not a child. I imagine he will kill you both, and then you will not be skinning people and putting them in cages. Three birds saw, out of the corner of his eye, one of the dark men sneaking toward him along the cliff edge. The man was short. So short he must have thought no one could see him. But three birds saw him and decided he had lectured the two bandits long enough. Somewhere behind him in the air, the spirits hovered like doves. He began to cry out his death song and stepped backward off the cliff. When Kicking Wolf came to, he was almost too weak to move. The tight bonds made his limbs numb, and his eyes were strange. Not far away, he saw a horse that appeared to be two horses, and a cactus bush that seemed to be two cactus bushes. The horse was Three Bird's horse, the one he had been tied to. It was only one horse, and yet when Kicking Wolf looked at it, it became two, and the one bush became two. Some witch had distorted his vision so that he saw two things when there was only one. It must have been Ahumado, or someone who worked for him. Then he saw that the rope that had bound him to the horse had been cut. To his surprise, near his head he saw Skull's footprint, a footprint he had often seen while he was following the rangers before he stole the buffalo horse. Skull must have been the one who cut him loose. Another puzzling thing. Kicking Wolf's tongue was thick with thirst. When he sat up, the world turned around. Three Bird's horse was still two horses, but the two horses were not far away. Kicking Wolf knew that if he could free himself, he could catch the horse and ride it to water. There must be water nearby, else the horse would not have stayed. Because of his thick tongue, it took him a long time to chew through the bonds on his wrists. It was dark when the rawhide finally parted. The vaqueros who had roped him had not taken his quiver. There were no arrows in it, so they had left it. But in the bottom of the quiver was a small flint arrowhead that had broken off one of his arrows. With the arrowhead, he was able to cut quickly through the rawhide that bound his ankles. Flies were stinging him all over his body where the skin had been taken off in the dragging. All he could do about the flies was throw sand on himself to cover the skinned areas. He found he could not hold his head up straight either. Something had made his neck so sore that he had to keep his head tipped to one side, or else a violent pain shot through him. When it became dark, Kicking Wolf felt a little less confused. In the dark, he could not see two of everything. He made his way slowly to where the two horses that were one horse had been grazing, and when he got there, one of the horses melted into the other. As soon as he mounted, the horse went trotting north. Kicking Wolf found that the riding made him sick. It also made violent pain shoot through his head, but he did not stop and attempt to recover a little. He was still in the country of the Black Vaquero. In his weakness, he would be easy to catch if Ahumado sent his men back after him. He remembered three birds who had gallantly come with him to Mexico, although he had no business there. 
Probably Three Birds was being tortured, but Kicking Wolf knew there was nothing he could do about it. The pains shooting through his own head were as violent as torture. He had to slow the horse to a walk or he would have passed out. In such condition, he could not go back to the Yellow Canyon and try to save his friend. Perhaps later he could go back with many warriors and avenge him. Even Buffalo Hump might join such a war party. He would not like it that the old man had tortured three birds to death. He might want to ride to the Yellow Cliffs and do some torturing himself. Near morning, the horse found water, a little trickling spring high in some rocks. The pool was only a few feet across, but it was good water. Kicking Wolf let the horse drink and then tethered him securely. Then he lay down in the water and let it wash his wounds. It stung, but it cleaned him. He drank a little and then drank more until his tongue became the right size again. He wanted to sleep by the little pool, but was afraid to. Ahumado's men would know of the water hole. They might catch him there. He rested an hour, let the horse drink, and then rode on through the day. It was sunny. He began again to see two things that were one. He saw a deer running, and the deer became two deer. Kicking Wolf knew a bad witch must have made his eyes untrustworthy. The pain in his neck and head was still violent, but he kept riding. He wanted to get back across the Rio Grande. Besides the pain in his head, there was also a sadness in his heart. He had had too much pride, and because of it, three birds was lost. Everyone had told him that his plan was folly. Even a foolish man such as Slipping Weasel, who did stupid things every day, had been wise enough to warn him against taking the buffalo horse to Mexico. But he had done it for his pride. But his pride had cost his friend's life, and he would have to go home humbled and shamed. Ahumado had taken the buffalo horse, the great horse of the Texans, as if he had been given a donkey. He had not acknowledged Kicking Wolf's courage or anything else. Even courage, the courage of a great warrior, didn't matter to the black vaquero. It occurred to Kicking Wolf as he rode north that the problem with his eyes might not be the work of a bad witch. It might be the work of his own medicine man, Worm. The old spirits might have spoken to Worm and told him that Kicking Wolf had shamed the tribe by his insistence on taking the buffalo horse to Ahumado. The old spirits would know what happened to three birds. The old spirits knew such things. They might have come to Worm in a vision and insisted that he work a spell to punish this haughty man, Kicking Wolf. Because he had had too much pride, Worm might have made a spell to change his eyes so that they could never see accurately again. Always he might see two where there was one. Kicking Wolf didn't know. His head hurt, his friend was lost, and he had many days of riding before he got home. When he got home, if he did, no one would sing for him either. Even so, Kicking Wolf wanted to be home. He wanted to see Worm. Maybe he was wrong about the old spirits. Maybe it was one of Ahumado's witches who had made the trouble in his eyes. Maybe Worm could cure him, so that once again he would only see what was there. When Skull awoke, Hickling Prescott was on his mind, and the smell of cooking meat was in his nostrils. His mother, a Tickner, had been a childhood friend of the great historian, whose house stood only a block down the hill from the great Georgian townhouse where Einish Skull had grown up. The world knew the man as William Hickling Prescott, of course, but Skull's mother had always called him Hickling. As Einish Skull was leaving for the Mexican War, he had gone by to pay his respects to the old man, then blind and mostly deaf. It was well to know your history when going off to battle, Skull believed, and certainly his mother's friend Hickling Prescott knew as much about the history of Mexico as anyone in Boston, or in America for that matter. To Hickling Prescott, of course, Boston was America, as much of it, at least, as he cared to acknowledge. Twice before, during the few weeks he had spent in Boston, Skull had made the mistake of taking Inez along when visiting the old man. But Hickling Prescott didn't approve of Inez. Although he couldn't see or hear and wasn't expected to feel, somehow Inez's determined carnality had impressed itself on the historian, who was not charmed. He didn't believe the sons of Boston should marry women from the South. And yet, to his annoyance, not a few sons of Boston did just that. 
Why, the South's just that riffraff John Smith brought over, Mr. Skull, the old man said. Your wife smells like a Spanish harlot. I sat next to her at dinner at Quincy Adams's, and I smelled her. Our Boston women don't smell. At least they smell very rarely. The Oglethorpes were low-bred, you know, quite low-bred. Well, sir, Inez is not an Oglethorpe, but I admit she can produce an odor once in a while, Inez said. There are several appealing misses right here in Boston, Hickling Prescott informed him crisply. I hardly think you needed to root around in that Oglethorpe bunch just to find a wife. He sighed. But it's done, I suppose, he said. It's done, Mr. Prescott, Inish admitted. And now I'm off to Mexico to the fight. Have you read my book? the old man asked. Every word, Inish assured him. I intend to reread it on the boat. The Oglethorpes produced many fine whores, old Prescott said. But, as I said, it's done. Now I'm working on Peru, and that isn't done. I'm sure it will be masterly when it comes, Einish said. Magisterial, I would have said, old Prescott corrected, sipping a little cold tea. I don't expect we'll have to fight Peru, at least not in my time, and I have no advice to offer if we do. It's Mexico we're fighting, sir, Einish reminded him. There was a silence in the great dim room whose windows were hung with black drapes. Einish realized he had misspoken. William Hickling Prescott no doubt knew who the nation was about to go to war with. It was reading your great book that made me want to join this war, Einish told him, anxious to make up for his slip. If I might say so, your narrative stirs great chords in a man. Heroism, strife, the city of Mexico, victory despite great odds, the few against the many, death, glory, sacrifice. The historian was silent for a moment. Yes, there was that, he said dryly. But this one won't be that way, Mr. Skull. All you'll find is dust and beans. I do wish you hadn't married that southern woman. What was her name now? Dolly, Einish reminded him, and I believe her people came over with Mr. Penn. Oh, that hypocrite, the historian said. It must have been a great sorrow to your mother. Your marriage, that is. I miss your mother. She was my childhood friend, though the Tickners in general are rather a distressing lot. Your ma got all the shine in that family, Mr. Skull. That she did, Einish agreed. There were no black drapes in the stony canyon where Skull had awakened thinking of Hickling Prescott. The walls of the canyon were pale yellow, like the winter sunlight. Skull had slept without a fire and awoke stiff and shivering. On such a morning, a little of Inez's unapologetic carnality would not have been unwelcome. Of course, he was in Mexico, whose conquest Hickling Prescott had chronicled so vividly. Cortez and his few men had captured a country and broken a civilization. When Skull had gone to the old man's house on the eve of his departure for the war, he had meant to probe a little, to get the old man's thoughts on events which he probably understood as well as any living man. But the old man had been indifferent, opaque. What he knew was in his book, and he did not see the point in repeating it to the young man. I ain't a professor. They got some of them at Harvard, he had said. Whip him and get home, sir, he advised, showing Einish to the door. That he had actually risen from his chair and walked Einish to the door was, Einish knew, a great compliment. There was, after all, a butler to show visitors in and out. The compliment, no doubt, was inspired by the historian's fond memories of his mother. I'd leave that Oglethorpe girl down in Georgia if I were you, the old man said as he stood in the door, looking out on the Boston he could not see. She won't do much harm if she's in Georgia. The Oglethorpe smell don't carry that far. But it was a meaty smell, not the memory of the old crabbed historian that had awakened Einish Skull from his chilly sleep in the Yellow Canyon. What he smelled was meat cooking. He didn't take in the smell with every breath, but intermittently, every few minutes, when there would be a certain shift in the wind, then came the smell. Skull cautiously looked around. The land was broken and humpy. Perhaps someone else was camped behind one of the humps, cooking a deer or a pig. And yet a fire would have meant smoke, and he saw no smoke. 
It's dream meat, he told himself. I'm dreaming of venison and pork because I'm rumbling hungry. I'm so hungry I'm dreaming smells. His only food the day before had been three doves. He had crept up on them in the early morning dimness and knocked them off their roost with a stick. He had seared the fat birds over a small fire and had eaten them before full daylight came. He knew he was in the domain of the old killer, Ahumado, and didn't want to be shooting his gun, not for a few days. Nor, ordinarily, did Einish Skull mind fasting. He had seen men killed in battle because fear and dread caused them to lose control of their stomachs or their bowels. In the time of battle, a fighting man needed to stay empty, in his view. There would be time enough for feasting once the battle had been fought. Still, he was human and could not be fully immune to the smell of cooking meat. Then he saw movement to the west. In a moment, a coyote came in sight, its ears pricked up, going toward the ridges to the south. The coyote was moving purposely. Perhaps it smelled the cooking meat, too. Perhaps, after all, it was not a dream smell that had brought him awake in the Yellow Canyon. Skull decided he might as well follow the coyote. It had a better nose than he did and would lead him to the meat, if there was meat. He walked for two hours, keeping the coyote just in sight. For long stretches, he lost the meat smell entirely, but then, faintly, if the wind shifted to the south, he would smell it again. Between one gray ridge and the next, he lost the coyote completely. The country rose slightly. He was crossing a mesa, or tableland, almost bare of vegetation. From being intermittent, the smell became constant, so constant that Skull could say with conviction that it was not a deer or a pig that was being cooked. It was a horse. He had eaten horse often in his trekking in the west and didn't think he could be mistaken. Somewhere nearby, horse meat was cooking. But why would the smell carry nearly a dozen miles to the canyon where he had slept? Then Skull began to notice tracks, many tracks. He was crossing the route of a considerable migration. There were a few horse tracks, but most of the migrating people were on foot. Some were barefoot, some wore moccasins. There were even dog tracks. It was as if a village had decided to move itself across the empty tableland. Then Skull saw the smoke, which seemed to be rising out of the ground a mile or more ahead. The smoke rose as if from a hidden fire. He didn't know what to make of it, but he did know that he had begun to feel exposed. He was in plain sight on a bare mesa where a hundred people or more had just passed. Skull looked around quickly, hoping for a ridge, a hump of dirt or a patch of sage, anything that could conceal him, even a hole he could hide in until darkness fell. But there was nothing. Besides, he was marching in stout boots, and his tread would stand out like a road sign to anyone with an eye for tracks. Skull turned and hurried back toward the last cover, doing his best to erase or at least blur his track as he went. Suddenly he felt more exposed than he ever had in all his years of soldiering. A kind of panic seized him, an overwhelming need to hide until dark came. Then he could come back and unravel the mystery of the smoke and the smell of cooking meat. Skull hurried back, scrubbing out his tracks as best he could as he walked. The last ridge had been rocky. He felt sure he could dig under one of them and stay safely hid until dark. Then he saw the old man coming toward him along his own track. The minute he saw him, he remembered something Famous Shoes had said. Ahumado is always behind you. Famous Shoes had told him. Don't look for him in front. When he wants you, he will appear, and he will be behind you. The memory came too late. The black vaquero was following the plain track left by his boots. The old man seemed to be alone, but Skull knew his men had to be somewhere nearby. The old man had not lived to a great age by being a fool. Skull decided he would just keep walking, with his head down, pretending he hadn't seen Ahumado, until he was in rifle range. He shot best from a prone position. When the distance was narrowed sufficiently, he would just drop to the ground and fire. With one well-placed shot, he could eliminate the black vaquero, the old bandit who had harassed the settlers of the border as ferociously as Buffalo Hump had the settlers along the northern rivers. Of course, the pistoleros would probably run him down and kill him, but then it was not the Skull way to die at home. His brother had been yanked off a whaling ship in the Hebrides and drowned. 
His uncle Fortescue had drunk poisoned kvass in Circassia, and his father had been attempting to ice skate on the frozen Minnesota River when he was overwhelmed by a band of Cree Indians. The skulls died vividly, but never at home. Skull had only a hundred yards to walk before he was in rifle range of Ahumado. He didn't mean to risk a long shot either. The one hundred yards might take him three minutes. Then he would have to decide between certain martyrdom and very uncertain diplomacy. If he chose to risk the diplomacy, he would have to live until Ahumado chose to let him die, which might be after days of torture. It was a choice his forebears had not had to make. His brother hadn't meant to get jerked out of the whaleboat, his uncle Fortescue had no idea the kvass was poisoned, and his father had merely been skating when the Cree hacked him down. Skull walked on. Ahumado came in range. Skull didn't shoot. Too curious about that smoke, he told himself. Maybe he'll consider me such a fine catch that he'll ask me to dinner. Then he saw to Ahumado's right four small dark men, to his left, a tall man on a paint horse had appeared. The black vaquero indeed had not been alone. For a moment, Skull wavered. Only six men opposed him. Ahumado carried no weapon. The only gunman was the skinny man on the paint horse. He could shoot him, grab the horse, and run. His fighting spirit rose. He was about to level his rifle when he glanced over his shoulder and saw, to his amazement, that four more of the dark men were just behind him, within thirty yards. They had risen as if from the earth, and they carried bolos, the short rawhide thongs with rocks at each end that Mexicans threw at the legs of cattle or deer to entwine them and bring them down. Skull did not level his rifle. He knew he had waited too long. Now it would have to be diplomacy. The fact that the dark men had simply appeared was disturbing. He had looked the terrain over carefully and seen no one. But there they were, and the die was cast. Ahumado came to within ten feet of Skull before he stopped. Well, hello from Harvard, Skull said. I'm Captain Skull. You have come just in time, Captain, the old man said. The man on the paint horse rode up behind him. He had a blinking eye. The dark men stood back, silent as rocks. Just in time for what, sir? Skull asked. To help us eat your horse, Ahumado informed him. That's what we are cooking over there in our pit. Hector, Skull said. Bible and sword. You must have a big pit. Yes, we have a big pit, Ahumado said. We have been cooking him for three days. I think he is about cooked. If you will hand this man your rifle, we can go eat him. The tall pistolero rode close. Skull handed him the rifle. With the dark men walking behind him, Einish Skull followed Ahumado toward the rising smoke. Skull stood on the edge of the crater, astonished first by the crater itself, and then by what he saw in it. From rim to rim the crater must be a mile across, he judged. Below him, at the bottom of it, were the hundred or more people whose tracks he had seen, men and women, young and old. They were all waiting. The smoke rose from a pit in the center of the crater. Hector, whose head was missing, had been cooked standing up in his skin. The old man, Ahumado, had scarcely looked at Skull since his surrender. His eyelids drooped so low that it was hard to see his eyes. Men had shoveled away the bed of coals that had covered the pit for three days. The coals were scattered in heaps around the pit, many of them still glowed red. We have never cooked a horse this big, Ahumado remarked. He appears to be thoroughly charred, Skull observed. You might as well let the feast begin. He felt chagrined. The old man treated his arrival as casually as if he had received a letter announcing the date and arrival time. He had walked into Mexico, convinced that he was proceeding with extreme stealth, and yet Ahumado had read his approach so precisely that he had finished cooking Hector in time for Skull to say grace if he wanted to. Now the need he had always had to be as far as he could get from Boston 
not just Boston the place, but Boston as a way of being, had landed him in a crater in Mexico where a hundred dark people were waiting to eat his horse. Ahumado made a gesture, and the squatting, waiting people rose like a swarm and crowded into the pit around the smoking horse. Knives flashed, many knives. Strips of skin were ripped off, exposing the dark flesh, which soon dripped blood from a hundred cuts. Some who had no knives tore at the meat with their fingers. They are hungry, but your horse will fill them up, Ahumado said. We will go down now. I have saved the best part for you, Captain Skull. This is a big crater, Skull said as they were walking down. I wonder what made it. A great rock. Jaguar threw it from the sky, Ahumado said. He threw it long ago, before there were people. I expect we'd call it a meteor up at Harvard College, Skull said. Then he saw four men shoveling coals out of another, smaller pit. This pit was modest, only a few scoops of coals in it. When the coals were scattered, the men lifted something out of it on two long sticks, something that steamed and smoked, although wrapped in heavy sacking. They carried their burden over to a large, flat rock and sat it down. Ahumado took out a knife, walked over, and began to cut the sacking away. "'Now this is a treat, Captain,' Tudwall said. "'You'd do best to eat hearty before we put you in the cage.' "'I will, sir. I've never lacked appetite,' Skull assured him. "'I ate my own pig as a boy, and now I expect I'll eat my horse.' He did not inquire about the cage he was going to be put in. Ahumado cut away the last of the sacking. Hector's steaming head stared at him from the flat rock. Smoke came from his eyes. The top of his skull had been neatly removed so that his brains would cook. "'Now there's a noble head if I ever saw one,' Skull said as he approached. "'Hector and I harried many a foe.' I had expected to ride him back north when the great war comes, but it's not to be. You were his Achilles, Signor Ahumado. Now the dark men carried machetes. Ahumado gestured for them to move back a few steps. Skull glanced back at the larger pit. Hector was rapidly being consumed. The dark people in the pit looked as if they had been in a rain of blood. So it must have been when the cavemen ate the mastodons, Skull thought. Then he turned back, pulled out his knife, and began to cut bites of meat from the cheeks of his great horse. <laughs> 